What's going on, people? Thank you for tuning in, and happy Thanksgiving, a special Turkey Day edition of the MMA Podcast. It is uh, November 23rd, 2016, about to be the 24th, about to be Thanksgiving. We got a ton of MMA to break down. Two UFC cards last weekend, one in Belfast and one in Brazil. Going to break them both down, along with Bellator 165, a potential fight of the year candidate with Michael Chandler and Benson Henderson. Going to talk all that. Got a UFC card coming coming up this weekend and a week full of news highlighted by Habib Nurmagomedov challenging Conor McGregor to a fight maybe accepting a fight against Tony Ferguson early next year we'll talk about it all thanks for tuning in let's do it to the MMA Podcast. <laughs> That's right, Lenny Hart. It is the MMA Podcast, and thank you for tuning in. Like I said, TMP 190. We're 10 episodes away from the big 200th episode. Uh, we'll uh, try and maybe have a few guests on for that. Who knows? Try and Try and try and have more more guests on in uh, the upcoming episodes. We try try to schedule some here and there. A lot of times they fall through, but uh, you know who never falls through. You know who's always there. Well, whether it's uh, it's cold, it's hot, it's snowing. Even though it never snows in Palm Desert, it's P Money. He's on Twitter at Sweet Pappy Jones. What's going on, dude? Oh, Big Jake, we are just maxing and relaxing. It is a wonderful Wednesday out here in right. SoCal. Uh, you know, the deserts, man, we got hot summers and cold winters. Uh, all relative terms, though, uh, it's probably in the low 70s here, maybe high 60s. Uh, beautiful, uh, beautiful affair, prepping for Thanksgiving and uh, prepping to break down uh, last weekend's action and uh, looking forward to this week weekend's action with you. And before we get into the uh, MMA stuff, I've 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 got to ask because it is a special Thanksgiving edition of the show. Um, Thanksgiving, more specifically, side dishes. If you had to pick one side dish, you only can have that side dish the rest of of your life. What is uh, what is what is the side dish you're going to? What's your go to Thanksgiving side dish? Oh man. Well, you got your stuffing, you got your sweet potato casserole, you got your mashed potatoes. Some like their potatoes scalloped. Um, yeah, some like it yeah, au gratin. Au gratin. You got, your, au gratin, you, you got yeah. your mac and cheese. You got some, some, some just like rolls. They like the sim- oh. simplicity of a king's Hawaiian oh. roll. Maybe we got a lot oh, of. We got, gotta I'm, have I'm, a good roll, bro. And I will include. So you know, I mean, apple pie, pumpkin pie. You got uh, a lot, a lot of Oof. choices here. Well, I don't think we can really include those as size, though. I mean, yeah. apple pie and pumpkin. I mean, yeah, that's fair. That's just, fair. That's fair. Uh, you know what, though, for me, number one side is cornbread, man. That cornbread. is, I got to have me some cornbread. Good some ass butter cornbread. on top. Yeah, it's, uh, cut it in the middle. You got to cut that. Mm. You got to cut it open. Slab that butter in the middle. And, uh, oh, yeah, hot butter cornbread, man. That is the side, at least for me, for Thanksgiving. What, what do you uh, typically what, – what's the the one if you're so limited for the rest of your life? Man, as much as I hate to uh, leave out stuffing, which I love me a little bit of stuffing with, with my uh, turkey, I got to go mac and cheese, man. I just uh, – you know, ever since I oh, mean, yeah. ever since I was a little ass kid, that that has been the num the the number one side. You know, where's, where's the mac and cheese at? But uh, yeah, I uh, I'm I'm going old school with with the old uh, n- not the box 
fucking shit. Actual, like, actual macaroni and cheese. If it comes out of a box, it's not macaroni and cheese. It's, like, those plastic-ass shells and this, like, metallic yellow goo that comes out of a fucking, like, little silver package. That's not macaroni and cheese. I'm, I'm talking actual, like, from scratch, macaroni, like, actual cheese, like, you're fucking making shit, like, the home, homemade real, real shit with, like, breadcrumbs on, on, on top, like, that's the real stuff, not if it comes out of a fucking box, are you kidding me? But that's a whole nother topic uh, we could dive dive into. Let's um, let's let's get to the MMA, which, dude, it was an awesome weekend. I guess we'll start with uh, the afternoon card, but it was really crazy as uh, the night went went on. I think it was around 11 p.m. and you had. Uh, the main event of the Bellator card going on. You had Benson against Chandler. You had the main event of the Bader card, Bader versus Lil, uh, Lil Nog, and the main event of Ko Kovalev Ward going on all at the same time. So if you had a bunch of screens, you were good. But if you were uh, limited and had had to choose, like me, uh, you had to make some rough decisions, which we will talk about later. But like I said, let's start with the afternoon card, UFC Fight Night 99 in Belfast. Um, as far as the prelims, both of the, I mean, kind of all three cards, both the UFC cards and the Bellator card, the prelims went as we imagined. We didn't see many upsets there. Uh, Kevin Lee with a nice second round rear, rear naked choke. Uh, Kyoji Horiguchi with an impressive one-sided decision against Ali Bagatinov, um, both of whom are one of the eight people that Demetrius Johnson has beaten on his current uh, championship run. Um, Loboff defeating Teruto Ishihara, pretty one-sided there. Um, Volkov and Stevie Ray winning split decisions over Tim Johnson and Ross Pearson. Any, uh, any fights stand out to you? Uh, we had Tough 17 alum Zach Cummings defeating Alexander Yakolev via straight arm bar in the second round. Yeah, you know, uh, I actually thought that performance in particular was uh, was pretty solid there. Um, man, it, as you mentioned, really the, the only upset uh, – that I can recall. I mean, Arta Blobov was actually a, a decent underdog against Teruto Ishihara there. Um, was he? But really, hmm. yeah, uh, shockingly. Um, I mean, well, I guess not shockingly. We've we've all seen Arta Blobov fight before, um, but yeah, so he he came through there. Um, other than that, though, as you mentioned, pretty much everything, uh, you know, as as predicted, Marion Renault, uh, solid TKO over uh, Milana Dudieva, uh, third round late TKO, uh, good performance there. Uh, really just, uh, you know, some good scraps all the way around. Um, Alexander Volkov, I thought, you know, he was uh, coming over there or coming over from Bellator uh, doing the the reverse jump, as it were. Um had a, a good show in the the fight with uh, Tim Johnson. You know, normally the uh, three round, uh, fifteen minute heavyweight affairs, um, they can be a little a little more uh, slow and grueling. This one, they actually had some decent action. They were they were winging them things uh, just about the whole time. There was a good amount of uh, cage work there, but um, they're still putting hands on each other and uh, good uh, good heavyweight scrap there. And that brings us to the main event, a uh, middleweight rematch between Gegard Mousasi and Uriah Hall. The two met actually just about uh, a year and a month ago back in Japan. Uriah Hall losing the fight late in the, or early in the second round uh, lands a jumping, and, and, and I'm taking this straight from Wikipedia, a jumping, spinning, back kick, flying knee, and punches. Which uh, I believe uh, I th think I heard Chad Dundas say it, which sounds more like a move out of the handbook of Mortal Kombat than like an actual MMA move. Jumping, spinning, back kick, flying knee, and punches uh, was how it ended back September 27th last year in the Saitama Super Arena. Um, since then, you know, you kind of would have expected Hall to keep going up. Move. Musauzi slipping a little bit. Maybe he uh, falls a little bit. S since then, the loser, Gegard, 
uh, has done nothing but win, and Uriah Hall has done nothing but lose. After beating Gegard, Hall losing fights to Robert Whitaker and Derek Brunson, who are actually fighting each other this Sunday. We'll be talking about that card a little later. Um, and then losing to Gegard. Uh, Gegard now on a four-fight winning streak after uh, getting a decision against Talis Leites and finishes over Tiago Santos, v uh, Vitor Belfort at UFC 204, and now Uriah Hall avenging that loss. Um, let's, I guess, talk about the fire. Is is there really much to uh, talk talk about the fight? I mean, it went almost as everyone expected. He, he was a huge favorite. Um, and it's not really a knock against Uriah Hall. It's more just Gegard is a master at just keeping distance and, you know, striking and just being so efficient and so tech, uh, technical. Um, the guy's a master. And Hall, as as much promise as he still has, I mean, you know, he's, he's uh, young, um, but he's shown some mental slip-ups in, in the past. And, um, I don't know, things not going the way he has wanted them to uh, since beating Gegard last year. Well, uh, what did you think think of the uh, fight itself before, I guess, we talk about what's next for other guy? Well, I thought this was a peculiar fight just in the way that this is exactly uh, really – the first fight seemed to start out very much the same way. Gegard dominating every aspect of the fight. Gets caught with some freakish uh, knockout in the second round. This one was, uh, again, Gegard from start to finish. This time it didn't even get out of the first round. It, it was just such a peculiar fight. I could not understand. I could have sworn Uriah Hall had some sort of semblance of um, ground proficiency but in this fight it was like as soon as Gegard got him down it's just he didn't know what to do he had his legs he was just laying in this fucked up position didn't really look like he was trying to fight out of it whatsoever um it was it was really just a um a performance where Uriah Hall just came out looked like he he really just rolled over for Gegard I mean I don't know um it was it was complete dominance for Musasi from start to finish. You know he showcased uh, some good hands jab that just popped Uriah Hall's head back, um, and you know really ex uh, executed his game plan to perfection. He he uh, navigated the distance perfectly, had the best of the striking, and uh, got the takedown, got the ground and pound, um, got the finish. It was just it was almost odd to me. I don't know. I, this this whole series between the both of them, uh, both fights have just left a, a weird figurative taste in my mouth, if you will. Um, I really don't know don't know what that is. Did you get any of that, Jake, with this one? What I don't know. I mean, I'm in in a way. I mean. I felt the the exact opposite. I felt, you know, as much as I'm a Uriah Hall fan and I want to see him do well, um, I felt, I guess, weirder after the first fight because I was like, oh, wow, that was a fight that looking at the matchup, I think at least eight times out of ten, Gegard wins, but he got caught. And I don't know, I didn't, didn't feel weird because I was more happy for um hall and i was you know i i was i was thrilled seeing him get such a big big win but in the lead up to it you know i was kind of a little bit bummed bummed out because it's like man this is you know if things go the way i expect them to and they did um this is really going to take a lot of steam out of the Uriah Hall train cuz uh that win over Gegard is you know kind of nullified now Yeah, true enough. Um, I mean, it's it's, and it's not one that really people are going to be clamoring for the rubber match for either. Um, yeah, it was it was an interesting uh, interesting main event. I mean, good to see Musasi get a get a, that momentum back, get an L back, and uh, you know keep keep doing his thing. I mean, who knows? Maybe twenty seventeen could be the year we see the Dreamcatcher fighting for a UFC title. 
indeed. Yeah, that, that, would, that would be uh, crazy. And and now the middleweights are kind of in a weird spot because you have Yoel, who it looks like he is going to fight Michael Bisping uh, early early next year. Um, maybe UFC 208 or 209. Um, we'll see Bisping versus Yoel. I'm assuming we're still going to get Rockhold Jacare, and that's just going to be res rescheduled for sometime early 2017. So whoever wins that fight will be next in line, obviously. Um, after that, I guess Gegard seems to be next in line. Maybe you pair him up with Chris Weidman. I don't know how, how long it's going to take, you know. After Yoel Romero turned his head into a fucking sprinkler, but uh, <laughs> yeah, that that um, I hope he takes a lot of time off just because of the concussive blow that Weidman took there. Um, I mean, honestly, taking a year off wouldn't wouldn't be the uh, dumbest thing ever. Um, so I don't know who you would pair Gegard up against next. Um, Weidman, I guess, makes the most sense, but if he can't step in, I'm looking now. Uh, your middleweight rankings, you have Biz being the champ, Yoel 1, Rockhold and Souza 2 and 3, as it should be, Weidman 4, Gegard 5, uh, Anderson Silva 6, which I think Tim Kennedy just called out Silva to uh, fight him after uh, Rashad Evans pulled out again. Uh, they were going to fight at 205, then Kennedy Evans was rescheduled for UFC 206, and again, uh, Evans failed his medical for an un undisclosed reason, which I'm sure we'll find out soon. Um, so Evans pulled out again, and Kennedy is challenging An Anderson Silva to fight him, which would be a fun fight, but uh, I don't really expect that fight to be made. Silva knows he's uh, worth a lot of money still, um, you know, having that... Uh, Champ championship record does a lot for him. You know, he's basically the, the uh, Michael Jordan of of the sport when Jordan was starting to get get older and wasn't the best in the league anymore, but was still the greatest of all 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 time. It's a weird spot Silva's in now. This is like this is like Silva in in the uh, middleweights now is like when Jordan played with with the Wizards. Like he's the greatest of all time, but now he's old and getting beaten by people. I don't know. Do you do you feel the uh, same about Silva? I think that's a pretty fair assessment. I mean, it's especially strange. the back-to-back -back Weidman losses, especially the second one with the leg break. I mean, yeah, Jordan never had to overcome anything like that. Jordan had the flu game. Which, you know, <laughs> was one night. He still played fantastic ball and then had a career of dominance uh, um, after that. And that was his legacy. Anderson Silva, yeah, I, I certainly feel, I mean, there was a time where nobody on the planet would bet against Anderson Silva regardless of who he was fighting. And, I mean, heck, when Anderson Silva versus Michael Bisping came about, was finally made. Uh, on this very show, I was saying, man, Michael Bisping has a shot in this one. He actually won that fight. Um, so, yeah. I, I what a am bizarre with fight you. that was, too. Well, no, yeah, that was... that was The most bizarre fight ever. Fight. Like, honestly, that's the most yeah. bizarre fight in the that, that the UFC has done post, like, you know, the freak shows of UFC 1 through 5. But that was, like, so bizarre. Yeah, that was a, a Twilight Zone kind of feel for that one. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but yeah, that's that's a very very apt analogy. I feel, um, yeah, Silva. I mean, a after that injury, you're gonna lose a step. It, it just doesn't matter who you are, and, and the fact that he is, he's probably still better than ninety five percent or ninety nine point nine percent of all fighters out there. But um, he could steal a win against any middleweight, still easily. Very easily, he beats most middleweights. Still, I, yeah. I, I mean, I, he's only. I think had... his spot at sixth is very uh, appropriate currently. I think that's where he should be. I mean, I think you could even make the argument he's he's still top five. I mean, yeah, maybe. There's there's still this day not a ton of guys I picked to beat Anderson Silva. No. No, and yeah, if there's one metric I I could uh, use, it's you know most title 
defenses ever and you know no no one else has 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 10 i uh believe you you have uh hughes and tito at five rousey at six and uh who's 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 at seven um aldo yeah rousey had six aldo had seven jones and mighty mouse have eight gsp had nine and anderson has ten so Mighty Mouse in a couple weeks here is going to be, you know, if he beats the winner of Tough, who there was a rumor it's going to be Tim Tim Elliott, I guess. Someone at Comcast like wrote in that that the name of the event is Johnson versus uh, Elliott. So maybe they messed up and Tim Elliott uh, won Tough. And I hope I didn't just spoil Tough for anybody listening. But. Um, yeah, um, well done. Jake. That's well done. that's that's the rumor. I'm not saying it's definitely true, but it's a rumor. Um, and yeah, that would put uh, Mighty Mouse at nine, which you you would think you know he's in 2017. If he doesn't move up, he's gonna pretty easily tie and beat Silva's record. If he hits 11, do you say Mighty Mouse is the greatest of all time? I do. I say if my if if. Dem- Demetrius Johnson defends that flyweight title 11 times. I'm calling Demetrius Johnson the greatest fighter of all time. Wow. Um, that is, is very bold. I mean, he's at eight now, he's, so three more. He, I mean, he would really have a case. I mean, let's take a look at what he did to Henry Cejudo, Olympic gold medalist in wrestling absolutely starched him in the first round like it was absolutely it was nothing and Cejudo I want to say at least engaged in some grappling exchanges there he was going for it Demetrius uh pulled a Negan and shut that shit down real fast uh spoiler hit him alert. with some spoiler alert he shut that shit down hit him with the elbows the knees I don't even remember what he hit him with I don't think Cejudo remembers either that was uh devastation that was a man who had won the gold medal in Olympics in the Olympic wrestling games, um, you know, defeats uh, or, you know, victories like that. Look, um, look no certainly. further than the record of Joseph Benavidez, who is mm. a masterful fucking fighter. And he is 24 and 35, 24. Yeah, he's 24 and zero against people not named Dominic Cruz or Demetrius Johnson. Against either of those guys, he's 0-2. So he's 24-4. and But, I mean, just dispatches everyone. And I'm looking at all these fights. None of these are really close close fights. They're all pretty one-sided decisions. Or, like, you know, the, the a- aforementioned Tim Elliott. He guillotine choked at UFC 172. I mean, he runs through everyone. And Demetrius Johnson KO'd him in two minutes when they fought last three years ago. And honestly, I think ben- Benavidez is going to be one of those three title defenses. If uh, Johnson beats Elliott or whoever wins tough, I think you do the trilogy with with Benavidez and then do one more to get him to, to 11, which three title defenses defenses is like like that's that like 90 percent of title reigns don't go three uh defenses i don't think the heavyweight title has ever been defended three times uh pins reign pins you know that that was a his historic reign he had at lightweight he had three title defenses like you know once once you get to five you're talking like historic reigns i think chuck had four like so getting three isn't a cakewalk but if johnson can get three more get to 11 um he's got to be the greatest of all time and i guess i'm gonna be uh relegated to saying it every episode now all i want to all I want to see is Dominic Cruz against Demetrius Johnson. And once I see that fight, I can die fucking happy. Um, wow, we got on a weird tangent going from Gegard Musauzi to Anderson Silva to De- Demetrius Johnson here. Um, a, uh, a long tangent, but we'll wheel it all, all the way back. 
Um, anything else on Gay Guard versus Hall or UFC Fight Night 99 before we flip into the triple digits? Talk about UFC Fight Night 100. Nah, man. Let's let's yeah. uh, talk about UFN 100. UFN 100. It was in uh, Sao Paulo, Brazil, and like I mentioned, uh, the prelims all went as we expected them to. Uh, winners, um, we saw Cesar Fajera, Johnny Eduardo, Pedro Munoz with a win, a, a guillotine choke over Justin Scoggins. Um, that that I, I wasn't re uh, really necessarily expecting, but uh, the main main card wins by Thomas Almeida, Claudia Gadelia, Christoph Jaco, Camaro Usman, and Sergio Moraes. Um all by decision, except for the second round TKO by none other than the young bantamweight Thomas Almeida. Uh, what did you make of those fights? I I didn't catch most of it live, honestly. I went back and I watched some uh, high, high, highlights. The uh, knockouts by, um, or no, the knockout, or yeah, the knock. And knockouts by Thomas Almeida, and I hope I pronounce his name right, Godzimarad Antugulov. Antigulov. Um, man, just um, excellent. Or no, it, that uh, was 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 a sub by An Antigulov over Marcos Rogerio de, de Lima, um, and Johnny Ed Eduardo was was the other uh, finish I was thinking of beating Manny. Gam Gamburian Hugh, who I'm hearing that might be his final fight, which, um, man, you know, struggled, never really made it to the top, but to be around for as long as he was, and he's been around for a while now, um, you know, that's, even though he never challenged for a title or anything like that, he, he definitely had a great ca career to have stayed afloat as long as he did in, in, in the UFC. Um, disappointing per performance by Justin Scoggins there on, on the fight pass prelims. Um, well, what did you make of all the fights leading up to the main event? Well, um, I'm with you about the Scoggins fight. Now, the only thing, I mean, of course, I can't uh, fault him too much. Pedro Munoz is a scrapper at 135 pounds there. But uh, I was Fucking wondering what Scoggins scrapper. was... I was wondering what Scoggins was doing at 135 pounds because he is normally a flyweight. And um, I had always liked him at 125 pounds. Um, I thought, you know, his skill set lended to at least um, having some, you know, a solid chance. I mean, still a young, uh, young mixed martial artist as it is. Um, he's only 24 years old. So, well, I, uh, I uh, think he, uh, after having trouble making weight against Ian McCall, um, because I think he pulled out of his last two fights. He was going to fight Ben Wynn at UFC Fight Night 85 and then uh, was going to fight e uh, Uncle Creepy at UFC 201, and uh, Scoggins pulled out because he said he wasn't going to make weight um, and that he was moving up to 135 full-time. Oh, boy. Well, this... Uh not not the uh, the biggest debut. I mean, again, though, that's uh, uh, a tough draw for making his bantamweight debut over here. Um, he had a good two fight winning streak in the 125 pound weight class. Uh, Fire trucks over... are coming. The takes are too hot, brother. Too hot, bro. Too hot. Uh, you know, Ray Borg and Josh Sampos, some good wins in the flyweight division. Um, it's it's too bad he couldn't keep it there. But uh, you know, again, still 24 years old. This is a guy you know, not even developing the man strength yet. So, um, still has a lot of room to grow. He's got a great skill set. He's with a great team. Um, hopefully he can, uh, he can rebound and, uh, uh, see some success at 135 pounds. Um, Johnny Eduardo. Yeah, certainly no surprise there. I had Johnny Eduardo by TKO all day and all night. And, uh, he got that rather handily. Um, you know, Manny, Manny did challenge for a title, but it was in WEC, against Jose Aldo. Um, that did not go That's so right. Well. I forgot about I mean, that. Yeah. That was that was WEC Aldo. That was uh, that was violent. Uh, Manny Gambirian was face down and unconscious uh, at the conclusion of that fight. 
Um, that was he, flying knee K K O U in eight seconds, Jose Aldo. That was that was that guy, and uh, you know actually prior to that. He um, he did challenge Nate Diaz for in the uh, it was the tough five finale, and then he was looking pretty decent in that fight until it looked like he had like a shoulder injury something like that. Uh, everybody was saying, "Oh, yeah, man, he, was he was nagged gonna... by by a bad shoulder his entire ca- uh-huh. career, and that fight especially is uh, it stood out." Oh yeah, and that fight, you know, a lot of people. Oh man, he was going to beat Nate. He was going to beat Nate, and um, you know he was looking good in that fight too, but. Yeah, the shoulder gave out, and, uh, you know, Nate took advantage of that. Uh, but, you know, hey, we've seen where Nate's career has gone after that, and, you know, maybe it was a good part due, due to the shoulder, like you mentioned. I mean, that's just something that's been with him his whole career. That was a fight that was almost a decade ago now, if not maybe even longer than that, um, his, his fight in the Tough Five finale with Nate Diaz. But, um, you know, he was, he was a solid contender, 135, 145 pounds, and uh, heavy hands, and, uh, you know, he, he provided a, a lot of entertainment to the fans over the years. So it'll be interesting to see if he does uh, stick to being retired. I mean, he retired in ring, um, and, you know, so we'll have to see if that was just an emotional decision or if this was something that's that's been on him for a while. Um, unfortunate to see him retire, but, you know, hey, if, if it's time, it's time. Uh, but, yeah, as you mentioned, again, this was another fight, pretty much everything, uh went uh went as we had foreseen uh you know thomas almeida defeating uh albert morales by tko no shocker there uh almeida getting the tko over the unknown guy uh claudia gadea uh, getting the ud over courtney casey um actually you know what maybe a little bit surprised that uh, christoph jaco was able to uh, get a ud over uh talus latus that was a good uh good performance from the uh the Norwegian Jocko, or uh, I'm sorry, the the he's from Poland, uh, the Polish mixed martial artist Jocko. Um, good, a uh, very solid victory for him at 185 over the uh, well seasoned former uh, title contender Talos Latis. It's gonna be like my turkey tomorrow evening, well seasoned. Um, moving on to the main event, Ryan Bader against Little Nog. Did you catch these these fights live when uh, as as they went down? You know these particular fights. Sadly, I did not. I caught the uh, the fight night ninety nine card live. Well, I caught actually, I caught the majority of this card live as well. I caught the majority of uh, you catch both the 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 end the Bader Little Nog fight live. Not live. I did. Uh, okay. I did have to catch a replay. Because that was about 8.15 Pacific, I want to say, 11.15 over here on the East Coast. And it was crazy because we had three main events all going at once. I uh, believe as as Bendo Chandler was going into the, like, into the fifth round, Bader Little Nog was going into the third round, and Kovalev Ward was going into the eighth round. I mean, all of them were going on at the same time. I chose to watch Chandler Bindo. Um, and after I watched the other two fights on replay, I decided that I made the right choice because Chandler Bindo was a much more entertaining fight than Bader Little Nog or Kovalev Ward, for that matter. Uh, Bader kind of did what we thought he would do, dominated the fight. Uh, Little Nog um, had little to no response for Bader's uh, double legs. And um, Bader was uh, beaten on him until, uh, I mean, came came close to stopping the fight before that, but ended up getting the stoppage uh, about four minutes into the third round. Um, you do you have anything on the fight uh, before we talk about what is next for Bader? Because uh, honestly, kind of a snooze fest. Well, I must say, um, I found this one to actually be a little more entertaining than their first encounter. Yeah, I feel like their their first encounter was just Ryan Bader. Um, I mean, again, this was a, a definitely a wrestling heavy victory. But he ended up getting the uh, TKO based on the ground and pound and, uh, you know, his work 
he was doing. He was starting off much more on the feet, you know, using some combinations uh, to open up the wrestling and, and the uh, takedown attempts and stuff like that. Actually looked like he got clipped just a bit uh, by a little nog in the first round. I don't know if he was seriously hurt, but um, potentially had his bell rung a little bit. But uh, was able to come back, get the takedown. Um, really, in, from the first round, worked that heavy ground and pound, uh, busting him up by the end of the first round. And uh, that was basically all she wrote. Second round, you know, basically more of the same. P put together two combinations and then just groundwork, ground and pound for the entire match. It was uh, a little bit more impressive for me from Ryan Bader just because, uh, you know, uh, even, even though – Nog has gotten older. I mean, they've both gotten older. Um, he was able to get the finish. It wasn't just, um, you know, that, that first match was just um, desperate shots. Oh, well, I shouldn't even say that because they, they, they were successful, but it was basically just laying prey the entire time, not a whole lot of action. Um, and this was a little more emphatic in spite of taking some damage. Um, was able to put the ground and pound, get the finish. So uh, um, better than their first fight. Yeah, and as far as what's next for uh, Bader, you know, this kind kind of puts him in a weird spot like uh, Gegard, where you have your obvious next in line in Rumble Johnson. Um, is Glover ahead of him? You know, Glover beat him back a few years ago, and currently, uh, currently, oh no, he he just lost to uh, Rumble at UFC 202. That's that's right. Um, currently in the rankings, the only ones above him. Are uh, Cormier, Rumble, who will fight for the title next at UFC 206, um, and Alexander Gustafson, who was actually originally supposed to fight uh, Nog before Beta replaced him. It was revealed he sustained a back injury, which was going to sideline him indefinitely. If if Alex can come back, I would love a fight between Bader and Gus uh, to fight the winner of uh, D DC and Rumble for the title. Um, you know, John John Jones, I guess, is going to be out until his retroact active suspension ends, like what next June or something. And I, I know it's next year, either in the summer or later on next year. Yeah, I believe it is uh, next June. Yeah, June six or seven. I'll have to dig that up. I think it was a well. It was a. Uh, it it it. I know it was a suspension re retroactive to the test that he failed on June sixth. I'm looking at his uh, thing now, so he will be eligible to return July 9th, twenty seventeen. Um, and then they stripped him of his interim title, making him the first fighter in UFC history to be stripped of a title twice. Way to go, John Jones. Um, wow. So, yeah, so Glover hey. come, coming off a loss to Johnson. Sorry. No, no, I was going to say, I wonder if there have been uh, other champion, other interim champions stripped of the title too because that's also uh, quite yeah. the dubious distinction. Stripped yeah. of his interim belts. Good job, John. Um, so yeah, I'm saying Bader, maybe Bader versus Gus next, and if Gus can't return, um, Glover it just lost. So let's let's see that grudge match between Bader and DC. Even though they haven't fought before, it's a grudge match because they've definitely jawed at each other quite a bit, and I'm sure it would jaw at each other quite a bit to sell a fight. Um, you got anything else on this card? UFC Fight Night 100, Bader versus Rodrigo, Mit, or Rogerio, Nogueira? Nah, big dog. Oh, nah, big dog. I, I, I think that uh, matchmaking is on point, though. As I was watching that fight, I was thinking, man, what's Gustafson up to these days? We gotta, gotta get yeah. him and Bader in there. They haven't tussled it up yet. Tussle. Like, like little tussle. That, that word, tussle. Um, that brings us to the Bellator 165 card. As aforementioned, all the people we know and have heard of pretty much won. Uh, Sarah D'Elio only got paid $15,000 in a dark bout against Jamaline Nevera, which she won via second round armbar. This is the same Sarah D'Elio who... Defeated the current UFC champion, Amanda Nunes, um, 
and she's now getting paid fifteen thousand dollars to fight. MMA is a cruel mistress. Um, fifteen thousand or fifteen hundred? I think she got paid fifteen thousand, which still is okay. Uh, uh, maybe, I mean, maybe, uh, mm, yeah, may, it Dog, actually we're may have Bellator been. Now. That that could be fifteen hundred. Yeah, that actually may have been. Here, let me let me uh, look that up while you talk about the Bellator once I mean, five prelims. I, I don't know. Uh, you know, Bellator they they've got that sponsorship opportunity, but uh, say what yes, you that's know, what like, I meant. Fifteen hundred to show 15, and to win. Fifteen hundred. Uh, yeah, that's, that's yeah, that's three what I grand. Meant. It's yeah. uh yeah no that's and her uh, opponent and, made fifteen hundred. Oh man, yeah, it's uh it's fantastic. No, as as far as the uh, the prelims go, I mean, like you mentioned, um, pretty much everything just went as as we uh, we thought it would. There was a ton of fights. There was seventeen fights altogether. Um, lots of dark matches. Um, Jeez, I, I don't even know. Uh, basically, everybody we heard of uh, had won. I was a little surprised. Uh, Linton Vassell had got a, a victory over Francis Carmon. Uh, Carmon was at one point doing some good things in uh, uh, the UFC. But, um, yeah, I don't know. Really, uh, really, the big payoff was the, uh, the main and co-main for, for this card. And the co-main, we call it a payout, but, uh, man, this was the worst showing in Michael Venom Page's career. Yes, he got the win. He still has not lost. He's 12-0. He's and 0. But in a career, just, I mean, everywhere you look, you have first-round finishes and amazing KOs and him cracking people's skulls open and then throwing pokeballs at them and toehold subs and rear naked chokes and doctor stoppages and crazy elbows and demolishing fucking hammer punches and amazing kicks and flying knees. This was, I mean, in a career that very much has mirrored and Anderson Silva's, except for instead of fighting for titles in the UFC, he was crushing cans and Bellator's. Um, this was Michael Page's UFC 112 Silva versus Maya, where Anderson Silva did nothing but go out and dance and run away and Maya slash Fernando Gonzalez was unable to cut off the cage and Silva just kind of toyed around and got the decision he earned because he did technically win that fight but uh, it was a fight that left people booing and left people very unhappy and uh, I'm sure Scott Coker will be in Michael Page's ear, very similar to the way that Dana White was in Anderson Silva's ear afterwards, which is don't go out there and make a fucking fool of yourself ever again like that. That's fucking stupid. Um, so I'm sure Page will learn from this. But, uh, yeah, terrible fight. Um, I love that one of the judges scored it to Fernando Gonzalez because that, that – that 10 seconds where you know it's a split decision but don't know who who won the fight that that was uh a uh, fun bit of drama there but um <laughs> yeah oh man no you're right this was uh that was a very disappointing performance um and really a lot of people man uh Michael Venn and Page honestly forget all the UFC washouts that that they're signing um, or I, I shouldn't even say washouts because now at this point they're actually getting some uh, some guys who aren't just being forced out of the UFC. They're getting guys who are jumping ship, um, free agent status. But be that as it may, Michael Venom Page is quite possibly the biggest draw that they have there. Everybody is looking to see, at least everybody who's into mixed martial arts, um, is, is looking at Michael Venom Page like, man, what can this young guy do? Where is he going to go from here? Um, he just looks like one of those guys, as you mentioned, through the, um, through the, uh, performances he's put on in the past, you expect him to come out there and just hit a whirlwind kick and internally decapitate someone and just win the fight by manslaughter, um, something like that. It just, there shouldn't even be, um, uh, an opportunity for the other guy. And this, this, uh, a very apt, uh, comparison on your point, uh, Jake, that this was, 
uh, Michael Page's UFC 112 just not an engaging fight. One of those fights where, I mean, he just came off. Uh, and you got to wonder, I mean, maybe could it be because he just literally caved in a man's skull in his last fight? Could that potentially have some uh, repercussion where, you know, normally we see a fighter. I never thought of that, but a, that's interesting. I mean, come on now. We, we always say, you know, fighters coming off the TKO loss. Are you know we see it a lot more tentative. You know they try and they, they come in with a smarter game plan. You know they're not just going in there biting on the mouthpiece and brawling it out. They're really coming with a tactical game plan. C- could it be that Michael Page, after literally caving in a man's skull, is is fighting a little different and and perhaps this is like an effect of some sort of remorse setting in to where. He wants to win, but he doesn't really want to hurt his opponent like that, which I think is, you know, that's commendable, and that's a mixed martial arts spirit, or at least the martial arts spirit, I should say, um, as far as the mixed martial arts spirit. I don't know about that, but um, me as a fan and, you know, coming from a background of growing up in traditional martial arts, um, it's one thing. You you want to see uh, an exciting fight, a good finish, but you never want to see a fighter irreparably hurt or, or damaged or handicapped um in in such a way um and it, it doesn't appear that uh cyborg will be um well at, at least handicapped in any kind of way he he should uh you know maybe not go back to the most active athletic life at least uh you know who knows if he'll be back in mma but still just no one wants to literally uh cave in another person's skull at least a martial artist that's that's really not what you want to do so um, who knows? I'm wondering if there was some some tentativeness from his last outing. Um, and that brings us to the main event: Michael Chandler versus Benson Henderson, uh, potential fight fight of the year. I mean, this was as much as you want from a fight back and forth. Um, I also scored it. Um, did I score this? Yeah, I. Uh, I think I scored this 48-46 Chandler. I think I gave uh, I think I gave round one a 10-8 to Chandler because he was just bulldogging and I mean just cha- chasing Bindo down for for the uh, finish. I think I scored the first round 10-8 Chandler. Second round Bindo roars back and wins. Third round. Uh, I gave to uh, Chandler. Fourth round, I gave to Chandler. And then fifth round, we get another rally from Bindo. But uh, it wasn't enough as Chandler took rounds one, three, and four pretty convincingly in my eyes. Uh, rounds two and rounds five going to Bindo. I saw a couple people saying round five was a 10 8 Bindo. Which, uh, yes, it was a one-sided round, but not nearly as one-sided as round one was. Uh, So I gave round one the 10-8 and not round five. Uh, And even if I had scored round five at 10-8, it's still 3-2 Chandler. And that would have made it 47-46 instead of 48-46, which was the way that I scored it. How did you score it, and what did you think of this uh, back and forth? I mean, we, you know, this this is one of, the, of 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 those fights that you want to show a MMA rookie, you know, if they're trying to get get into the sport. Because not not only was it back and forth and had a you know high exciting pace, but we saw all of MMA. You know, we uh, saw wrestling, we saw striking, we saw ju. Jiu Jitsu. Um, it was uh, it was a very fun scrap. Yeah, it certainly was. And um, Michael Chandler, he really uh, he really brought the fight to Benson. As far as how I scored it, I mean, six of one, half dozen of the other, as the old saying goes. Really, if you want to call it a forty eight, forty seven, or forty seven, forty six, either way, I, I still think um, like you, Jake. I've got one, three, and four for Chandler. Um, and two and five for Bendo. And I think really, if, if you want to call, um, round five, a 10, eight for Bendo, I'm giving Chandler a 10, eight for round one as well. Um, I just, I, I thought it was a, a fantastic scrap. Really. Um, I, I'm a much bigger fan of, uh, uh, a Michael Chandler than I have a Benson Henderson. Benson Henderson is a fantastic mixed martial Racist. artist, but for some reason, 
Oh no 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 no! I love I love me uh, I love me uh, black my, slash Korean people uh, Polynesian uh, or well yeah yeah no that's right uh, Korean uh, absolutely love them all you know individually uh, in in mixed fashion you know I'm I'm not a I'm not a judgmental type of guy I'm a mutt myself you know what what do you want what the fuck do these people want Jake you know hey. Uh, <laughs> but really, just as as far as mixed martial arts style is concerned, um, I feel like Benson Henderson has been in some of the most exciting fights that there's been. But I feel like it's mostly due to the other fighters he's fighting. His fights with Donald Cerrone, his fights with Anthony Pettis. Um, these are so Cerrone and Pettis are two of the more exciting fighters um, that we've ever seen. Great striking styles, also. Great everywhere the fight goes on the feet on the ground, um, and Benson is as well. That's um, that's why you see him mixing it up like that. But I just Benson is the decisionator. He is the 155 pound GSP, except for he didn't have that exciting streak of finishing people before his rise to fame. It's just always kind of been that way. Yes, he had the he had the scraps with Donald Cerrone years ago. Years ago, his UFC run. Go back and look at that UFC run. Tell me how boring was every single fight along the way. Um, and I, I had Chandler in this fight to win. Um, just he he presses the action just a little bit more. Um, he's he's very aggressive. He's got the heavy hands. He's great everywhere the everywhere the fight goes. Um, Benson certainly is one of the best 155 pounders. In mixed martial arts, he absolutely has to be. I I don't um, I don't think that that's being debated by anybody. But for me myself, style wise, just not my favorite style. It's a rare day you see a finish from Benson, and for me, it's it's a rare time that I'm entertained. This happened to be one of those times, um, you know, because he was he was getting that fight put to him, and. Uh, I think uh, I think the correct uh, the correct decision was made, and I think you're uh, also correct, Jake. That this was definitely to be watching live, and have your pick of the three. Um, this definitely was uh, was the correct choice. You got to go with uh, with this one. I mean, over Ward Kovalev, and a rematch with uh, Bader and Nogueira, Chandler Benson. That that was something new and exciting. And there are, yeah, I, I uh, wanted actually to uh, talk um, Benson. I don't know what's next for him. You know, he said earlier this year that he was going to join the, the the military reserves when he was 33 because that was like the latest year you, you could sign up for it. And it's something he's always wanted to do and wanted to give back and do his civic duty, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And you have to join when you're 33 maximum. Um, and he actually joked, I think it was an interview with Helwani, and he joked, now that means I can be 33 in 11 months, I don't have to join on my 33rd birthday, which I believe he turned 33 just last week. So, um, he also did say that he was speaking to a recruiter and that he would be able to keep fighting along with a career in the military reserves. So, um, I don't know how that'll work out, but that seems to be his plan, and, um... You know, this this I believe was his second fight in Bellator. He's now o o and two, or did he get? No, no, this is his his, his third fight. Yeah, he uh, got that uh, that fight against Pitbull Friar to earn the chance to fight Chandler, but uh, now has fought for the welterweight and lightweight straps in Bellator. Lost both fights. I assume he'll stay in lightweight. Doesn't seem like he has any issues making that weight. Um, and we will see who's next for him and if he's able to work his way back up to a title shot. But it will be a while now that he's been given two in the same calendar year and lost both challenges. For Michael Chandler, I don't, you know, I don't think many people, people, uh, many people really keep themselves updated with uh, the Bellator lightweight rankings. But Chandler, you know, he's got a streaky. Cr- career he went like 12 and 0 then lost three in a row now he's on a three or four fight winning streak um who he'll fight next um i have no no idea but i'm sure uh i'm sure we will hear soon from coker and bellator um you you have anything else on that card before we move on 
I think you put a bow on it nicely, my man. All right, let's go to the news. As far as the news goes, pretty much dominated uh, by Habib Nurmagomedov. I mean, his legions of fans are taking over, like Dana's Instagram and Joe Rogan's Instagram and posting hashtag Team Habib and hashtag Habib time everywhere you look. Um, Habib apparently sent Connor a DM today. Which I'll read with a broken Russian accent. Connor, you're the champion now. You need to fight with me. If you run every time you look in the mirror, you're not going to respect yourself. Your kids not going to respect you. Your friends, your family won't respect you. Die like samurai. Don't chicken out, please. I know I'm bad matchup for you, but the champion and you need to fight the best. It's okay. Die like Irish warrior. Don't run like chicken. Irish people have history and fight for a long time. You need to represent your people. Um, so strong words from Habib, who apparently was really jockey and bad for the fight against Connor. Connor, as reported by Dana White um, and posted by Damon Martin on FoxSports.com, Connor apparently isn't going to fight until May 2017th. Uh, he, the, his 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 first child will be born in May. Connor will not be fighting until after May. Whether he fights in the summer, I would assume. Honestly, hearing that July jumped jumped in my my brain because he he said after May, six week training camp means maybe the baby's born. He's around for a few weeks. And uh, he'll probably want to get the fuck away <laughs> after that, that thing's crying in his face for uh, three or four weeks. No, but uh, seriously, you know, the money time to fight is that July 4th card. That's usually when they do International Fight Week. They get a ton of folks in Vegas and really try and put on a big event. Um, I'm sure Connor will, will be training through all of this and a six week fight camp to make uh to lead up to a July fight wouldn't make a lot of sense. Um but yeah Dana White confirming the Irishman will be out for several months, which brings us back to Habib, who really wants to fight Connor for the light lightweight belt. Um it leaves out Aldo, which is a topic we've talked about a bunch on the show in the last weeks and I don't want to beat it to death. Um but it seems like Habib Nurmago Madoff is now happy with a potential fighting against Tony Ferguson um, today going on a Russian talk show and saying that that's probably the fight that's going to happen next. Um, What do you think about that? Habib versus Tony. That's... um Whew, that is a fight. I don't care. I don't, I don't care what is going on that night. Plans are getting canceled and I'm watching Ferguson versus Nermigo Madoff. Oh, 100%. That's a... Uh... A lot of people are going to have sick grandmas that day. Uh, a lot of people are not going to be showing up to work. That fight will be lit if that fight happens. And, you know, I hate to say it, but really, even if Connor weren't taking the time out for this whole pregnancy thing, which I think, come on, bro, you can squeeze in a little title defense before uh, before that kid pops out. But uh, that's neither here nor there. He's taking the time. I guess that's how it's going to be. He needs to defend that featherweight belt. Habib needs to slow down. Yeah, uh, seriously. Jose Aldo is is the originator of the uh, pitching a bitch and crying, um, wanting to fight Connor super bad and needing that title shot. Everybody, my God, it's it's really exactly like Connor said. All these guys are just um, just all on the jock. They all want to fight him. They they know that's where their bread is going to get buttered. Everybody, Tyron Woodley, the 170 pound champ. It's like, eh, I don't know. You guys want to see me fight Conor McGregor? I mean, I could fight Woodley again, but I don't know. I heard you guys were talking like you wanted to see me fight Conor. You want to see me do that? You know, uh, my goodness, it's um, that's got to be a huge advantage for him just going into any fight. These guys really do seem to be just at his mercy. It is his and his alone, his his will, his schedule, and uh, everybody else is playing by it. It's it's quite um, quite amazing. Um, but be that as it may, um, I think his, his first plan of action when he gets back is whenever that is, needs to be defending that 145 pound belt, whoever it's against at this point, I don't even really care if it's Aldo. Um, I just want to see that belt defended one time, just one time. 
let's see if he can do that. Um, for me, that's that's number one. And then uh, let's see how that plays out. Move forward to 155. I mean, he won that belt a couple weeks ago. You know, he hasn't been holding up two divisions for that long. He has been holding up the featherweight division for almost a year now. It's been almost a year since he won that unanimous belt. So um, it's it's getting to be about that time. We need to see that defense. Uh, Habib can can shut the yab for a bit, quiet down the street team, call off, uh, you know, call off the hooligans and, uh, you know, get ready for that fight with uh, Tony Ferguson. I hate prospect killing matchups, but at this point, pff, these guys literally have nobody else to fight. Habib's on like an eight fight streak. Uh, Ferguson's on like a nine fight streak, 10 fight streak. I can't even keep track of these guys streaks anymore. Um, it's, it's going to be a fantastic scrap. I don't even, I don't even want to predict that it's, it should be, um, insane though. That's for sure. For sure, man. Um, yeah, and you have uh, Aldo, who has the interim belt. Um, Max Holloway calling him a pussy for some reason, even though he's he's uh, going to fight Tony Pettis, I think, uh, pretty soon here. December 10th, I think, is when they're going to fight each other. Um, speaking of another up- upcoming fight, Fedor versus Matt Mitrione made official. We actually reported this three weeks ago via, I think it was Dwayne Finley in Flow Combat who originally reported on Fedor versus Matt Mitrione. But that's official for February 18th in San Jose. Uh, which should be fun. Um, apparently, Mitrione didn't even know he was fighting uh, till it was announced on Bellator. But uh, I don't know. Maybe it was a wise move by Coger to not tell Matt Mitrione so he wouldn't spoil it. Who knows? Um, you have any more news? That's all the news. I it was it was a slow news week, so to speak. Um, I got really nothing before we talk about this coming Sunday's card and then put a bow on it. Yeah, no, I believe, uh, that's, that's about it. Really nothing groundbreaking. Uh, um, Thiago Alves was suspended three months for his weight miss at UFC 205. That was recently announced. Um, kind of, uh, it seems kind of like kind of an arbitrary suspension just because it's very rare. Um, that fighters fight quicker than three months, um, especially yeah, anybody strange. who knows Thiago Alves. And Kel- Kelvin got uh, benched six months for not showing, right? Uh, I believe so. Uh-huh. I believe so. Um, Romero was suspended 60 days by the New York uh, Athletic Commission, uh, New York State for Athletic busting Commission. busting Chris Weidman's head open too nasty. <laughs> Beat dead ass too bad. A 60 day suspension, uh, actually for jumping out of the cage. After oh, that's beating right. Chris Weidman. That's right. He did yes. that. Yes. Yes. Uh, so yeah, there was a, there was a few, a uh, few slaps, few slaps on the wrist, uh, going around there, but, uh, yeah, nothing, uh, Nothing earth shaking, no earth shaking announcements. Not like Fedor versus Mitrione. I mean, that's that's certainly uh, that's certainly it. Yeah, um, that brings us to this Sunday's card from La- Rod Laver Arena in Melbourne, Australia. Uh, Sunday, November twenty seventh, and it is an Australia card. So let me look up the time for you because I'm sure it's going to have a weird time. No, actually, it has a uh, U.S. friendly time. So I'm sure the people watching it in Australia are pissed off. But uh, the early prelims will start 6.30 Eastern and the main card kicks off at 10 p.m. Eastern, which I don't think is that that bad. I think it's like 10 a.m. for them about. But, um, yeah, a, a, a morning card for, for the Aussies over there in Melbourne. Um, which, uh, anything stand out to you? We'll talk, talk about the main event, but, uh, I'm looking forward to the match, the co- co-main of Jake Matthews and Andrew Holbrook. Uh, we're also going to see Kyle Noak versus Omari Akmadoff, which Akmadoff was one of the more promising names of 2015. 
Um, and then uh, slipped up a little bit, lost two in a row to Sergio Moraes and Elizu Santos. Santos looking to get back in the driver's seat. Uh, the Korean Sohi Ham fighting Danielle Taylor, Chris Camozzi versus Dan Kelly, John Tuck, Damian Brown, Ben Wynn versus Gene Herrera. Not the thickest card, not the most stacked card I've seen in my entire life, um, but a, a, a lot of fights that should be fun going down best fight odds, uh, a lot of fights that are close. Uh, as far as Vegas sees it. So we'll probably have a lot of close, exciting fights. You know, I don't think we're going to have a lot of one-sided beatdowns here, uh, including the main event where Derek Brunson's only minus 140. Um, anything stand out to you aside from that middleweight main event? Uh, in a word, not really. It's uh, As I look over this card, there is... No notable fight or really no meaningful fight other than the main event, Robert Whitaker versus Derek Brunson. Um, I hate to say it, but that really is what it is. From from my estimation, just glancing over the card, um, hardly a meaningful or ranked fighter uh, to be seen for the uh, UFC fight pass preliminary portion. Dan Hooker versus Jason Knight is the featured prelim bout. Um, who versus who? Uh, I'm just kidding. Dan Hooker, uh, he's uh, he's been in some pretty uh, exciting fights, win, lose, or draw. Um, but uh, really, just the, the name factor is not there for this one. But as I always say, I'm not going to discount this one immediately because oftentimes you get some of the best action. These, you know, these guys, they're looking to... You know, they're looking to get a Wikipedia page if they win this fight. You know, that's that's really what this is about. This is <laughs> the this, winner this gets is a Wikipedia wiki- page. <laughs> the winner gets a Wikipedia page. You know, then you can start fighting for rankings for for titles, things like that. Um, this is this is just to get on that wiki map, son. That's um, hilarious. And they they're gonna be going hard. They're gonna be going hard. You know, uh, down under, man. They uh, they like to potty hot, but they like to play hot too. And, uh, wait, that's the same thing, party and play hard. Uh, well, they like to fight hard, too, I'm sure. That's, uh, they're, they're intense. They're going to be intense. Uh, should be some good fights. Uh, yeah, not, not the most for name value, but, uh, certainly, uh, certainly hoping we see some, some violent finishes, if nothing else. Yeah, and speaking of violent finishes, that's what we've seen from both guys on this main event. Um, wait, it's our... All right, so it's actually all right. So it, it's not Sunday night. It's going to be Saturday night for us, but Sunday morning and afternoon for the Australians. All right, because I saw a poster that said twenty seventh Sunday, but I guess that's a poster they drew up for the Australians. So for us uh, in America, um, and if you're not in America, disregard what I'm saying. But for the U.S. Um, for the East Coast specifically, it will be Saturday night. Prelims on Fox Sports 1 starting at 8. The main card starting at 10. And like I said, Robert Whitaker and Derek Brunson, just both uh, a couple of savages, both on five-fight winning streaks. Robert Whitaker, uh, after losing to, to Wonderboy Thompson, beat Mike Biggie Rhodes, then moved up to middleweight and won four more fights, finishing Clint Hester, Brad Tavares, earning decisions against Yaya Hall, and Rafael Natal. Uh, Derek Brunson, on the other hand, after getting TKO'd by the current number one contender at middleweight, Yoel Romero, uh, has won five in a row, got a unanimous decision on Lorenz Larkin, and since then has uh, TKO'd everyone in the first round. Ed Herman, Sam Alvey, Juan Carnero, and Uriah Hall all first round TKOs, heavy, heavy hands coming from Derek Brunson, looking to get his third win of 2016. Um, Brunson a slight favorite here, but I am going with him. Just, I mean, this is this is tough, and you know, I could see either guy taking it, but both of these guys like to walk forward, and you don't see I, I either one really, you know backtracking much so i think this is just going to come down to who hits harder and as much as as a soldier as whitaker is and as you know he's definitely 
probably got the bigger toolbox to work with. Derek Brunson just throws heavy, and I have him getting another first round TKO. Um, honestly, the winner of this this fight probably gets himself up into that Weidman gay guard range of uh, middleweights. I mean, this is this is a big fight. Um, and, uh, both of, both of, both of these, uh, dudes are, uh, let's see, Brunson's 32, I think Whitaker's like 25 or something, yeah, which, uh, you know, all, all these, uh, guys pretty, pretty, pretty young, 32 isn't that old, uh, Gegard's only 31, which he's been around so long you'd think he's, he's older, but, uh, the guy just started out super, super young. Um, who do, who do you have between Robert the Reaper Whitaker and Derek Brunson? Boy, this is a, this is a great scrap and a real, um, man, real close one to call. Both are on great win streaks, both five and zero oh in the 185 pound division. Uh, great to see Whitaker getting some success. You know, he came up after a TKO loss at 170 to Stephen Wonderboy Thompson and, has just looked better. Maybe, you know, the weight cut was taking a little bit too much out of him at 170 pounds, but um, his chin has been holding up well. The the power has certainly been there. Uh, we've seen him, uh, you know, with this devastating TKO over Clint Hester, uh, knocking out Brad Tavares, um, and he's, he's also shown some good cardio. Wins over Rafael Natal, Uriah Hall, Mike Rhodes. Um, he's, he's really uh, got a, a solid... Um, solid streak under him. He's really heading in the right direction. Uh, Derek Brunson himself though, man, he, um, he's always been, uh, towards the top. I mean, his, his fight, uh, um, uh, against Yoel Romero, he was, he was absolutely winning that fight before getting knocked out in the third round. That was just a brutal loss, uh, brutal setback there for, for Derek. But since then, speaking of a guy that's come out, uh, just stronger than ever. Uh, four, four TKOs in a row in his last four fights. Uh, five wins in a row. He's 5-0 and oh in his last five fights. TKO and Ed Herman, Alvey. I mean, just um, he's really putting it all together. And as we saw in his fight with Yoel Romero, he was even able to outgrapple Yoel um, until Yoel hit the big Hail Mary. So he definitely has a deep toolbox himself. He's really good everywhere it goes. I think Vegas has it right having him a slight favor in this one. Oh, man. I like Whitaker just a little bit better in the pocket exchanges. I think um, I think he's a little bit more comfortable standing in there and uh, fighting in the phone booth, as it were. But I don't think that's going to be Brunson's game. Brunson, he's a good striker himself, obviously. Uh, again, four TKOs in a row. And... He's he's really great at using the distance, using uh, that that explosiveness, and I think that's what we're going to see in this fight. Um, I don't really think it would be wise for him to stand in the pocket, trade with Robert Whitaker, and I don't think that's what we're going to get. I think he's going to try and use the distance, uh, try and mix it up from the outside, uh, hit him with some uh, some long shots, and mix in the grappling in there as well, and. Uh, I think I have to go with Derek Brunson myself. Uh, if not for the unanimous decision, then for, uh, I'd say like maybe a, hmm, I'm thinking a, a late late submission here, maybe like a fourth round sub. Fourth round sub for Derek Brunson. And unless you have anything else, I think that's about it for me. Uh, thank you for tuning into the MMA podcast. Pat, you got anything for the people before we sign off? Jake, I've got nothing but unconditional love and respect for the people. Right. We're, we're thankful for the listeners this uh, this Thanksgiving week. And I uh, hope, Jake, you yourself, uh, you, you're doing the Lord's work here, hosting this thing, producing this thing, putting God the whole damn us. thing together. God bless us. God bless you, good sir. Thank, happy Thanksgiving to everybody out there. Uh, hope everybody has a lovely one and uh, always a pleasure. Enjoy the turkey and the gravy. And if you're not in the U.S., have a, you know, buy buy some fucking tur- turkey anyway and put some gravy on it. 
because that's the way you got to do it on November 24th. Cornbread, baby. Cornbread. Cornbread. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, next week, we'll obviously be breaking down the Whitaker Brunson card, and it'll uh, we'll have two Bell- Bellator cards to preview. Dantas versus Warren and Frieri versus Campos, 166 and 167, a Friday-Saturday pairing. And that Demetrius Johnson card will also be Saturday, December 3rd. Um, we'll also see Benavidez, Cejudo, Allenberger, Masvidal. It'll be a fun card. Thanks for tuning in. We will be back next week. And uh, until then, we got him. Tune into the MMA podcast every Tuesday night. Oh my God, yo. the wild style, always been a foul child. Will I, sucker? I be the coming yeah. like number. The MMA Podcast, Jake is the host And since Ramsey's been in the wheelchair The Aunt Jimmy Show has been on a road I wanna say John Jones is a hoe So I think that I'll pick up the phone And dial 213-457-3380 We got hot takes on the stove You get blood on your clothes if you're sitting in the front row I throw one my geek and then I lace the hoops I'll have Yao lying down cause he ain't the truth